Hi, welcome to Inside the Moms Club, where being a mom is the coolest place to be. Here in the Moms Club, we believe that what embarrasses you now will make a great story later. And let's face it, you don't laugh sometimes, you're going to cry. Join us in having a good laugh together. I'm Monica Samuels. You are now inside the Moms Club, your private destination for all things mom. Welcome, moms. Welcome to Inside the Moms Club. I'm your host, Monica Samuels, and you will note today that I am without my co-host, Julie Orchid, who is jetting off to Europe as we speak on her European vacation, which includes a trip to the Olympics. So she's going to be in Paris, which is very exciting to me because I can't wait to see what souvenir she brings back to me. And I guess depending on what that is, we'll see whether she's back as co-host next time. But no, I'm just kidding. She's we miss Julie and she misses being here because I know for a fact she would love to be here to talk to our guest today. One thing we've got to interview such amazing people here on the Moms Club, but we really love it when we can talk to somebody who has incredible talents that maybe we don't personally possess ourselves and we can learn something from them. So, for example, our guest today is an incredible singer and performer. Personally, me, um, I am not, I can't sing. Let's just I'll be honest. I've, I've been told that I could carry a tune in a bucket if there was a lid on it. So I'm just not good at singing. Although I was in the choir in middle school and I did get a letter in choir. And I do remember the look on Mr. Sawyer's face, the choir director, when he announced my name. It was as much shock on his face as it was on mine because I think he might have accidentally put my name on the list. But I'm good for volume. Maybe that's why he gave it to me. And then the other thing, and this is even a bigger deal, I am a terrible cook. I mean, I'm the first one to admit I am the world's worst cook. In fact, when we did this, when we started this show, we sent some photos in so that they could create this logo that if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see it. But on our YouTube channel, you can see that the logo represents parts of my life. So example, there's me, there's a wine glass in here. Occasionally I'll have a glass of wine. I'm a champion shopper. That's one of my great talents. But then I sent some photos of myself cooking. And what they came back with was a fry pan with a huge flame coming out of it, which is pretty accurate. So I am this is something that I'm not, I'm really not good at. But you know, I have been watching our guest's show, her new show, which we'll tell you about in a moment, and watching her on Instagram. And I'm, I'm inspired to think that maybe I could actually do this. And who knows, maybe even sing too. I don't know, but we'll see. So we without further ado i am thrilled to welcome one of a, a one of everyone's favorites she took the world by storm as part of the 90s most famous trio wilson phillips and since then she has hosted her own daytime show won a tv cooking competition and helped normalize talking about weight loss struggles and she is now the host of a show on access called sounds delicious with carney well wilson please welcome the iconic the rock legend carney wilson welcome to the mom's club that was quite an intro well carney we are so excited that you're here this is this is as we say here on the on the mom's club this is amazing we are so thrilled to have you here Thank and you. first let's hear all about your your show you're so much it's you're so much fun to watch. I mean, whether you were cooking or just standing there doing something else, I mean, just entertaining for sure. But how did it start? How did Sounds Delicious with Carney Wilson? What was, what was the genesis of that? Well, thank you for having me. And that was like the longest intro ever. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I feel like my my home is I mean, where my children are, and it used to be when I was in the recording studio, but when I started cooking, that's when I found my true place, I think. And um, I, I, I think it's more about the love of feeding people. And I know that's a, a, like a part of the nurturing part of me, you know, I'm, 
I come from that family where my grandmother was a really good cook and she, and I remember cooking with her, baking with her, stealing her little chocolate chips. She used to get so pissed off and because um, I would eat all of her chocolate chips for her cookies. But like, I just, I don't know. I find comfort. I, I'm a sober woman, so I have to like do something with my hands, my creativity. Um, and I find that it's, it's like an outlet you know, um, and, and, and also a joy. So, um, food excites me and inspires me. It makes me hyper. It makes me, um, I don't know, just, it, it makes me feel, uh, I know that's weird, but food makes me feel and, and I love watching people eat. I know that's weird. But so, and when I was doing the show, we filmed 12 episodes. I don't even remember half the things I said, cause it's just, it's, it, they really let me just like, they just kind of like pressed record and then here we go. And that was really it. And I, you kind of never knew what you were going to get. Honestly, when I watch your episodes, you can feel what you just described. You can feel the love. I mean, yeah. the, the yeah. cooking is an experience with people that you can really share. Sure. And so your grandmother was a great cook for what you're saying. Did you cook with your mother or what, what was the experience in your own family with cooking? Because I know my mom was a great cook and that was part of the problem because she was a great cook, and so we just ate. We didn't share in the cooking experience. Right. But did you do you, that you, as a family growing up? or No, I didn't. It was really only my grandmother's house. I mean, my household was, you know, wacky and definitely not this conventional, whatever you want to call it, um, quite dysfunctional, I would say, really dysfunctional. So um, I always found sort of like solace in food, but the the cooking my my mom was not a cook i mean she's never afraid to admit it was like cans of beans and hot dogs you know that was her that was but grandma was great this little jewish grandmother she made great brisket she made incredible matzo ball soup and everybody talks about their own grandmother's version but uh, honestly it was we were very close with my grandparents in fact i have a little picture of her right right in front of me on my <laughs> oh <laughs> really... how sweet yeah <laughs> My little grandma with her little curly hair, uh -huh. her little, her little uh, nightgown, you know, and I just, and she's with me every day. I love her. Her name was May. And she's the one that really was like the matriarch, you know, especially of the kitchen. So I don't know. We, we didn't cook much with mom, but we could eat. We could eat for sure. Now, I saw you cooking with one of your daughters on the show, making mac yes. and cheese. So is it something you experience with your own daughters or... Yeah, yeah, they, they do. I mean, Lola more than Lucy. Lola's 19 and Lucy's 15. And Lola loves to bake. Um, I think Lucy will, she, she used to help me like chop vegetables and she was really, really like meticulous about how she was really, really good. I think Lucy could get into the culinary, culinary world at some point. But Lola um, is studying psychology and now she's totally busy, but we used to bake together. She makes a good sugar cookie. That's for sure. But, you know, they, they've been tasting every, this, my poor family. I mean, all I do is shove a fork in their mouth. I go, taste, taste, taste. Because they have to, I want to know what, what they think. And because the recipes I make, I mean, I make them over and over and over again. Because I feel like I'm never getting to like, I, I'm, I don't know what I'm searching for. I'm searching for like the ultimate of, of everything I make, which is kind of lame. But because it's exhausting. Because at some point you got to be like, okay, it's good. Now stop. And that's my neuroses, I think, you know? Yeah, you know, that's kind of the challenge for me personally is just the time it takes to do it. And I've, I have yeah. a little bit of ADHD, so if there's more than four ingredients in the recipe, then I'm just overwhelmed. <laughs> and my sister recently, she moved to a town in Texas. You'd think every place in Texas has great Tex-Mex, but she found the one place that it wasn't so great. So she got every recipe from all her favorite Mexican restaurants, and she decided to make the perfect Tex-Mex meal for the family, which she did. She started at 2 p.m. and she was done with everything clean up and everything was like 10 p.m. Yeah. So then you have to decide, do I rather eat the mediocre Mexican food or do I want to spend all day in the kitchen? And so that to me has always been the challenging part. So have you found some secrets to making that a little easier? What, what are some tips you'd give moms out there? Because a lot of moms, that's the challenge for everybody out there yeah. trying to cook with a family. 
time management is is totally crazy and I have a very erratic schedule. So it there's never anything consistent for me. And that's that's a challenge in and of itself. So that really makes it harder. Um, I think one of the great things is prepping and um, sort of like digging around, searching around, like what do you feel like making and what can you do in advance? The steps you can take and you can freeze things, you can make sauces in advance, you can chop vegetables in advance, cut cheese in advance, whatever it is. And then, um, you know, getting up a little bit earlier. The problem with me is that I put food and cooking before exercise. And even though I've changed my diet radically since last September, radically, um, I'm still sticking to that. But I, in the blurry background here, that's a treadmill. And I don't go on that thing. And I think that I, I almost, I, I'm not, not almost, I admire the, the women and the mothers that put exercise a prior, as a priority, which I think is smart. Um, but honestly, I put food before exercise. That's the truth. I put cooking before it. So I will do that instead of you know, the hour that, that moms are going out and doing their hiking or whatever, I don't want to tell them not to do that, but maybe split it in half. I don't believe we need an hour of exercise every day. I think we need 20 minutes a day and I think it's great. So uh, maybe the other, the other 20 minutes prep, you know, wash your vegetables, chop them up, put them in a container and you're ready to stir fry later. Just stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, and you do. And, and, and also, sorry to interrupt you, reading recipes, follow recipes. Don't just wing it and think you, you know, you know what doing all the time. Just get a, get a recipe and, and look at it and read it in its entirety. The ingredients, the instructions. So you know what you're doing, you know, know what to expect. And then you're not crazy with surprises. I have thousands of cookbooks, thousands. They, they take up the walls in my dining room and I read them like they're, like they're novels. And I've learned a lot from that. I actually have thousands of cookbooks at my house, too. <laughs> but sadly, I haven't even um, picked one up yet. What's <laughs> oh, interesting, you said, talked about exercise and, yeah. and that facet. You do have to schedule that, for sure. So when, you're, when yeah, you don't have time... like sex. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So when you don't have time for that, then you have to think, make food choices. And I have to say, you look amazing you or amazing as we say you look great well thank you so as far as like food choices because i know for me personally that's the other thing the the cheating part of dieting or eating or whatever is the tricky part because i can for some reason i think that if i sneak into the pantry and pull out a couple of cookies and nobody saw that somehow that's not going to affect me later like that doesn't count because nobody knows about it so you have to plan what you're eating to, you know, help with your with your weight. So what do you do? Because you, you look great. And the fact you're telling me that that treadmill is a somewhere you hang clothes or something. Yeah, I mean, really. I can't even believe it because you look yeah. you look tremendous. So would you have any some secrets you. you could share? You know, uh, gosh, cheating is I don't like the word cheating. I'll tell you why, because I think it gives us the it makes us feel bad. And um, like we, if we don't stick to something so perfectly, then we're not good people or we're flawed or whatever. But that's the point. We are flawed and life is in session. And so I can't predict, you know, what's going to happen when I travel, if a plane's going to be delayed. I can't predict what my children are going to do. I can't predict, uh, you know, you know, an earthquake. I can't predict anything that could happen. That was a weird example. But I mean, the point is... I have to learn how to roll with it and know that there are so many choices for me and there are so many options, but I do have a sort of no list now. I decided to cut out certain foods that I know are bad, tr they're triggers for me. You know, refined sugar is a trigger for me. Gluten is a, sh is a, is a trigger and it sends me into spirals of like hell, mental and physical hell. After, I'm 56. I know the foods that make me feel bad and good. I always want the bad foods, but I decided that uh, after I was really like physically challenged, I thought I had gallstones. I had to go get uh, an ultrasound on my belly. I thought, you know, I've had issues. I've had gastric bypass, lap band, all this stuff to help over these years. And it did help me lose a lot of weight and keep a lot of weight off. But it was more about 
not sort of like being like morbidly obese and all that stuff and all these these effects that we have being really heavy because at some point they're going to catch up to you it was more about mentally the obsession that i was having and i couldn't let go of like i have to have a scone i have to have a croissant i have to have toast i have to have you know um desserts I was going crazy and then it started really hurting my belly. So I thought, I, I didn't test for celiac. I didn't do any of that, but I just thought, all right, let's elimination. Let's start with that. I cut out sugar and I cut out gluten and it has really made a difference. I still am like the get most gaseous woman on the freaking planet. I will always like just be queen farter, but like I don't crave so much. I'm not ruled by food. And that is a really hard thing for me because I have this very alcoholic, addictive mind. And I know who I am. I am a true recovering alcoholic who is obsessive beyond. So I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know how I have let go of these foods. But God knows that if I don't have a replacement that I'm happy with, I'm not going to stick with it. So I've learned the good stuff to like... Oh, I can have chips and salsa. I can have my quesadillas with corn tortillas. I can have potatoes and rice. That, I am okay with that. I'm just not going to have the flour tortillas or the brioche bun or the regular pasta. And it sucks. But I'm still satisfied having the other things. So I know that was a really long answer. No, I think Um, it's a really good answer because I can totally relate to that in the sense that, first of all, refined sugar is a drug. Let's face it. I mean, it is. is. And so once you're on it, you got to get off of it. Because I know for me, if it's anyone's birthday, I immediately kind of go spiral into a panic mode because if they put buttercream frosting in front of me, I literally will eat the whole cake. No, it's my favorite thing in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's really then you just keep going. Then you're eating all the bad things you're not supposed to eat. So you really do have to buttercream train yourself. I mean, you have to just accept the fact that's a drug. That's like any other drug. And society's convinced us that that was okay, but it's really not. But there are good substitutes. So there are. What are some of the ones that you found that that you love that I mean, I saw that you did a little dessert on on your Instagram. Now, I did do the glucose monitor for a while, because I'll be honest, too. I, I was pre diabetic. So my doctor put me on first Wigovi, which I have to say was the worst thing. Yeah, you're going to lose weight. Ladies out there, you are going to lose weight on it because you're going to feel chronically ill. It is not, if, if, if feeling constantly nauseous is a way you want to, well, you want to lose weight, then I recommend that drug. Oh, I, but then I, she I, put I, me on Mongiorno, and then of course you lose muscle mass. So there's, ultimately you don't want to be on these drugs. You want to do the healthy thing that's the rest of your life, you can eat this way and be satisfied with it. So what are some of your hacks? Oh, what I was going to say is I did the glucose monitor and I was eating a bunch of bananas. My glucose, because I saw that was one on one of your little plates where you put a banana and then you had the chip. I thought, well, I actually can't eat bananas. Look, sounds because it would just shoot right through the roof. For sure, yeah. But so each person's individual. But what have you found that people could try that that you recommend that these are good substitutes? So don't get me wrong. Like I eat a little bit of ketchup if I have a few French fries or I like to dip some eggs in it. I will eat some peanut butter that has sugar in it. Um, that I'm not giving up, but I do not eat sugary desserts and I don't, I try not to eat anything with refined sugar. So I look at the labels when I shop. So like brown rice syrup is a good substitute date, date, syrup, date, sugar, um, uh, coconut sugar. Um, my challenge is starting to bake. I can bake gluten-free, but baking gluten-free and sugar-free, good luck. That's hard to make things that are really good. It's possible and I'm doing it, but I'll have maple syrup. So glucose is not really what I'm concerned about, even though I should be because I was also pre-diabetic. So I was almost scared into doing this as well. Um, I just know that if I, that if I don't eat refined sugar, um, in any more than like, you know, two grams at a time or whatever it is, then I I don't, I don't spike, I don't drop, I don't crave. And that's what I, that's my goal. Um, so let's see when I want something really sweet, I'll go for like a Lara bar. 
Um, there's a peanut butter and chocolate chip one. Yeah, there might be down in there's brown rice syrup or whatever it is, but I feel like I get what I need. Um, I'm not neurotic about it. I'm not going crazy. I'm not guilty. I'm not cheating. And it doesn't, it doesn't send me into a tailspin. Um, once in a while, I'll drizzle agave, agave syrup on, I'll have a, a rice cake and I'll put peanut butter, sliced bananas, a little cinnamon, and I'll drizzle some agave or a little maple syrup. And I mean, not like a big drizzle, just a little bit. You get the taste, you you feel like you're eating this sweet thing and it's delicious. So I know if you're diabetic or you're pre-diabetic, you have different concerns. But for me, that's what I do. I'll have like a healthy, you know, bar or something like that. Yeah. So do you try yeah. to incorporate a lot of these things in your recipes on your show? Because I notice on your show, you've got pancakes and yeah. no, sweet, not fun things. No, the show had, I think, zero. I mean, I think we roasted asparagus. That was the healthiest thing we did. Uh-huh. Um, no, 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 no. And, and it's funny cause it's, that was never the goal. It's, it's like, and the thing is when I tasted the food 80, 90% of the time I turned around and spit it out in the sink and rinsed my mouth out. And people are like, don't say that stuff. Cause it's like, it's not healthy to talk about that. Cause then it sounds like it's bulimia or whatever. No, I don't swallow it and throw it up. And I know it's a sensitive topic. It's a sensitive, like all these other topics are sensitive. There's ways we can talk about it that doesn't, um, you know, make you look like you're a hiding anything um, or or influencing someone in a negative way. If somebody wants to taste something and spit it out, I do that with desserts because I found if I want to taste it, I put it in my mouth like a brownie. I made brownies last night. I'm doing a radio show tomorrow morning. I love to bring desserts for people. So I made these caramel uh, Heath Bar brownies. They were insane by this great baker. I made these brownies. I put it in my mouth. I took a bite and it was all over my tongue, my teeth. And then I spit it out and then I rinsed my mouth out. I got, I mean, I took my finger. I mean, this is, this is, I'm telling you the truth. I spit it out and I rinsed my mouth out three, four times. Mm -hmm. And that did it. So I got to taste it and it's, it's a little psycho, but I don't care. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't, I don't think that is. You that's get to it. enjoy I mean, it and uh, you get to enjoy it, but it doesn't, you know, have long term yeah. repercussions. Well, right. you know, as as the mom's club where we have talk about families and kids and everything. Now, you grew up in an incredibly famous family. Of course, your dad is Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, who's, you know, a true rock legend. Yeah. And Marilyn Ravel of the Honey. So you and you mentioned you grew up in kind of a dysfunctional family. So what was it what was it like growing up in a family that's that iconic truly? I mean what was that like? Well, uh I mean there's a lot of ways there are, there's a lot of ways to answer that, you know, it's it was uh privileged in a lot of ways. Um we didn't worry about money. I went to a private school. Um you know, I wasn't as, I was a spoiled kid, but I wasn't demanding. Well, I, I my teenage years, I, I wanted, I mean, shopping, you talked about shopping. Oh God. And I still, I still love it. Um, I don't know how to manage money. I really don't. I still don't. But um, I remember <laughs> just, you know, never really being able to experience sort of that mother, father sitting around the dining table, eating dinner together. Uh, it was, it wasn't like that for us. And so um, that I really missed, missed out on that. And, uh, but some of the beautiful things, um, there was always music playing. We were a musical household. My mother was, um, very loving and expressive with her love and, uh, a great, a very young, I mean, she had me at 20 years old. I mean, that's like my daughter mm-hmm. giving birth in 11 months. And I just, I can't believe that she really sacrificed her, her youth. I think she got married at 16 and, um, you know, my dad was, was struggling with a lot of mental issues and, you know, so successful. And, uh, it was a difficult childhood because I, I did yearn to have that father figure and my grandpa, we talked about my grandma being a great, you know, baker and cook. My grandpa Irving, Irv, mm-hmm. was this, he was from Germany at a thick accent and he was so tall and so sweet and loving and funny and he was really great. They came over every weekend. So it was like my household was filled with relatives and we had parties and there was food. And so it wasn't that it was always bad or negative. It's just that 
my dad had some some odd you know wacky behavior and at some point my mom was like this is too much this is too dysfunctional and for our safety and our well-being they divorced and and that was hard i'm not going to sugarcoat anything i never do yeah I mean, so how did all that translate now you've been married 24 years Yes. I mean, I don't know if they give awards or records here in Hollywood, but, um, <laughs> you know, you probably are vying for that. And you have two lovely daughters, like you said. And looking at it as a as a fan, just watching, you know, looking at your Instagram page and things like that, you have a pretty normal looking family. I mean, you, your family life now looks like it's very all American sort of family. So yeah. how did that translate? Did you intentionally seek that kind of life for yourself with your own family or you know, uh, I just think because of all the therapy I've had, my sobriety, my my program, uh, my husband, he's he's like a normie. You know, um, he's a great guy, a great father, and and there, we've always been on the same page with our children, and we we communicate pretty well. Um, but we also have have our own issues too. I mean, it's like. What, it's all sacrifice. It's all compromise, not sacrifice. It's compromise, you know, and like the priorities of what's really important here. We bicker constantly. He, why do you do that? Why do you do this that way? What you're annoying with this. And then I go, well, what are the really important things? Trust. Trust is number one. Um, you know, sh- uh, showing your love, um, not, not, uh, not drifting so much in your own fears, you know, telling your partners the things that you're afraid of, the things that you appreciate, the things you love, doing doing acts of kindness, um, making sure that we sit down for dinner, making sure that we, that these kids know that we love them. Mm-hmm. When I, but, but I have to be honest, sometimes when we're at the table and we're all sitting there and I see uh, all of us sitting there, I sort of have like these moments of like almost outer body experiences. Like I'm like I'm back, I sit back and I look at the picture and I look at, and I go, oh my God, this is what, what's in my head. Wow, we're a family. This is, these are my two daughters, here's my husband and we're having dinner. And it sometimes it feels not uncomfortable, but sad. And I think it's just the sadness for uh, my own childhood and my own self. And then I go, well, that's being selfish because now you're thinking about yourself. But it's hard. It's, yeah. like, it's, it's human nature. Um, so when I start to go there, I go, don't be negative. Don't do that. Be in the moment. It's good. It's not. It's good. It's good. And it's for them. Mm-hmm. So a, I think a good mom puts her children first, their well-being first. And we got to take care of ourselves to be there for them. You know, like you're on an airplane. You need to put that mask on you first before you put it on your kids. But it is such a balance. And I think that really is the key. It's just a balance. Yeah. Now, your daughters, I know one of them sings because I've seen her on TV performing. So does do both your daughters, are they both singers or they both have that talent or? Yes, yes, they are. But one of them just will not. Lucy just refuses to do it in in public. She's or even in front of me. She used to. And, the, and I go back to all my videos because I was so obsessive filming us, you know, recording us. Oh, my God. It was, oh, we, they were, like, Lucy was like five singing three-part harmony. Yeah, we're definitely all musical together. And it is the most beautiful thing ever to be able to sing with them. Um, I have a show next month with Lola. We're doing this this private show. We do big shows and private shows. And we have a private show uh, on August 10th. And... Um, I'm so excited. We're we're just singing a few songs, but it's Lola and my husband and I that are going to sing. Oh, wow. Great. Great. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, yeah, because I'm not very good at math. That's why I went to law school. But I can't count to three. And I thought, wait, she's got two daughters. So yeah. she was this icon of the 90s trio. What about, you know, her, she and her daughters? That's the next group. And then they can have a whole private, you know, as part of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame can be dedicated to your whole family because you know, that would be like, amazing. Love amazing. I, yeah, it would. It yeah. would. Um, yeah. That, that's, I, I, I like the way you think, but, yeah. you know. I like to it's think. It's not always my, that, that kind of stuff is not, I mean, I know we, it's sensational in some way, but it's never my goal. Yeah. You know, um, I was born into this. 
and it is my place and it's my happiness and my joy, yeah. music and singing. And the fact that my daughters love that too is really a blessing. And if they said to me, mom, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a, a, a plumber. I want to be a receptionist. I want to be, you know, a an anthropologist, I, whatever. I would say, great. But the fact that it is music, I mean, I have to admit one thing. When the babies were in my belly, my husband and I prayed more than once. We would go, please, God, let them be musical. Please don't let them be tone deaf. Please, no tone deaf. Because that would really be bad. So yeah, thank God they one. came out and they weren't tone deaf. <laughs> yeah, that would well, be, you would have uh, been really well, disappointed no. if, 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 right. this is, if I was the result. So lucky you, you've got two very talented <laughs> daughters. Well, Carney, we have some other moms who would love to talk to you. And those are our Zoomer moms. So welcome, Zoomer moms. Welcome to the Moms Club. <laughs> Ladies, I know you've got a lot of questions for Carney, so I am going to go around and introduce each one of you. And so please tell us a little bit about yourselves. And you have a question for Carney. It's Shafoli. Welcome to the Moms Club. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. Hi. How are you, Carney? It's so great to meet you. Um, I told some girlfriends the other evening I was going to be on this um, and get to meet you and they broke out in their own rendition of Hold On. It was terrible, but also adorable. Um, it was adorable. Um, so I live in Princeton, New Jersey. I've known Monica and her husband and their kids for a number of years. Um, I have an 11 year old daughter. And so just hearing you talk about your girls um, and how involved they are in so many of the things that you are passionate about, was just really special and really moving. And actually my question sort of comes from that. Um, did you find that you had to sort of encourage them to do these things that you love or did they naturally migrate to it? And I ask because I'm sort of approaching this phase with an 11 year old who used to want to do everything that I did to now it's, you know, she can kind of take it or leave it sometimes. And I want her to be her own person and find her own passions but I also want her to do things with me. <laughs> I, oh, that's great. Um, that's a great question. And it's nice to meet you too. Um, you know, I think the, for me, the most important thing was, is, uh, was always expressing to them, I don't care what you do. I just want you to feel passionate about something, you know, tap into uh, uh, something that makes you feel good or, you know, something you gravitate towards. And that I think ultimately will lead to their happiness because it will be authentic from within them. And, and, and they, they might know when they're 11, like your daughter, they might know when they're 15, they might know when they're 40, who knows. But um, as long as they um, know that they deserve to feel uh, passionate about something and that something can make them feel happy. Um, I think that now, uh, it's it's easy for kids to become depressed and lost uh, because I do think COVID had a big part of that. Um, I think it really threw a wrench in it for adults as well and how we approach parenting them. And I do have, and my Lucy can is sensitive. So, um, and we're all sensitive, but I think just the most important thing, like saying to them, it's really like, without putting like this negative cloud over it, like, and say like life is short because you know when you get older we always say life is short make the most of it you know you don't want to make these kids feel like they're in a hurry or that you know that we're all doomed i mean we we are but like we have to make the most of this so i don't want to say those things but i want to say to them let's spend time together let's make sure if you want to do this or you like that go do that but let's find something we can do together and I'm not this poster child for, for, for that, okay? It, it doesn't always happen. But just little things. Like once in a while I say, please, can we go bowling? I know you guys hate it, but I, I love bowling. Can we just go? So we make sure that one of the birthdays we have a bowling party. Or, you know, um, we take a walk together. Or we go in the kitchen and make some cookies or brownies together. Whatever that is. Or, or we go to a movie together. Or we go to a concert together. Or they come on stage and sing with me. Whatever it is that we can incorporate together, I think that's important. But it's not my ideas, too. Not just my ideas. Asking yeah. them, what do you think we could do? What do you think would be fun? Like I'd say, let's go to Michael's and let's go to the craft store. Let's get something and let's, let's you know, let's... 
uh, oh, like, like for instance, right now, I want to uh, paint the walls inside our house. And I said, let's do that together as a family. My husband's a great painter. He used to do that before he met me. He was painting and playing music, but he's like an awesome painter. So I'm like, great, let's get the roller and do it together. Stuff like that. That's great. Yeah, that's a, that's great. You know, actually, and it's good you mentioned asking the kids what they really want to do. I think sometimes yeah. what parents do, what moms do especially, and I know I was guilty of it sometimes, choosing things that I think, well, that's going to look great on your college resume, so you need to go do whatever and not right. really letting them drive it. Jennifer, welcome to the Moms Club. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and do you have a question for Carney? I do. I have so many questions, Carney. So well, good. ask one. <laughs> to meet you. So fun um, to hear all about what you're up to now. Um, I, I live in Austin, Texas. I have an architectural practice. I have um, about to be a free bird. I have a child going off to college, my last, and one who just graduated from college. So um, I am moving into the period where my kids are adults and actually need to learn to cook for themselves. Right. And um, you know, in, in, in Austin, we like food almost as much as music. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of interesting food happening here. And, um, you know, I have cooked a lot with my kids, even though I'm not the best cook. That was my mother's gift. And um, I was the kid like your daughter who was chopping things up for my mom and, you know, just being her sous chef. Yeah. And um, so I'm good with a knife. But um, I'm now I have more time. And I've loved watching your show because the music and the cooking, they sort of go hand in hand and you can tell that you're so collaborative. And um, so I know you said you mentioned using recipes, but I mean, how much, I mean, you're such a creative person, like how much of it are, are you sort of riffing off of the recipe? Do you make your own recipes? Like what is, what, what do you love to do in the kitchen? Like, is it like baking is really, um, by the book, and I can see you bake a lot, but you also do a lot of savory cooking that looks a little bit like it could, you could get more creative. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Lola is has transferred now. She's going to be staying in a dorm about an hour and a half away. So she said, Mom, it could be on the East Coast because I'm in L.A. So I'm like, you're right. You're right. I'm not going to go crazy. I'm going to miss you so much. So I, I, I want to ask you questions about how you're dealing with that because that's I'm, I'm very, very close with her. And I know that when she leaves and she said to me, I'm, you know, I'm scared to go. I said, you're going to be great. And, uh, and we, we just a car right away, you know, mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, in terms of the, the recipes, it's funny because I try to look at meals like protein first, right? So I sent her a meal around a protein and I'm a little obsessive about it, actually. And that, I think that started after I, I had that surgery that helped me lose a lot of weight where we were focusing on protein. But I think it's healthy for your muscles. So protein, you know, one, God, I'm always making different meals for everyone. It drives me crazy. Lucy doesn't want to eat what everybody else eats, uh, you know, and we kind of all have different tastes. So I start thinking about a protein. And um, sometimes I follow a recipe. Uh, I'll I'll think of a chef like I'll think oh oh Giada Giada has a great uh, turkey meatball recipe. So I'll go grab her book and I'll do that. And now I think I'm sort of like I'm a little more confident in with with making up my own. So like like two days ago I made I took um, pork and beef and made meatballs and I was like, all right I I've done this so many different ways. I found, I go, I, I spend time at the market and I look around and I go, I'm making meatballs. What can I do to this meatball that will make it really good and different? I found these baby pearls of cheese. They're kind of like a provolone and a mozza, uh, mozzarella combined. And I thought, I'm going to stuff them with those little balls of cheese. Great. Got fresh parsley. Uh, I got regular Parmesan, um, you know, and, and milk, but I did gluten-free breadcrumbs. So I soaked the breadcrumbs. Like learning how to cook. I think a lot of it is not being afraid to fail. So I've had a lot of meals where I'm like, oh my God, this tastes awful. Throw it out. I had to throw it out. It's not even edible. Throw it out. Okay, what did I do wrong? Learn from it. So I fall back on my mistakes. I fall back on my successes. And um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like figuring out for your family, what do you like to eat? What do you like to eat? And I sort of try to like please everyone I like everything except liver and caviar. I'll eat anything except liver cav and caviar. So I'm with you. you can put anything in front of me and I'll be happy. You know, most of it. Um, but um, 
I'm trying to narrow this answer down. I think um, it's about experimenting and trusting your instincts and not being afraid to use salt, citrus, and herbs. So if you, um, spices, herbs, salt, citrus, if you have that in your cooking, I'm telling you that it's going to taste good. Um, it's learning the balance. So let's just say you want to make a quick chicken dish. I always fall back on, I pound the chicken thin, I saute it, I do cooking spray first, I do a little bit of olive oil, um, I season with, season with salt and pepper, I put the chicken breasts in, um, once in a while I'll do like a, um, a gluten-free flour and I'll, or cornstarch and I'll mix it with some hot water, deglaze it with chicken broth, put some capers in, uh, a tiny little pat of butter sometimes at the end. There's, there's just ways to like make things taste good. Lots of lemon. You can't go wrong with that ever. And it's, is it on pasta? Is it on rice? Is it on a salad? You know, you can cut it up, and put it on a salad. Is it on um, quinoa? You know, I love quinoa now. I'm trying to make more stir fries with quinoa and brown rice. So yeah, it's like if you have an hour on a Sunday to kill, go experiment with something. Yeah, and it sounds like that technique you could use for fish or pork or like it's not just for yeah, chicken. Absolutely. My new thing is making like, um, I go to this market called Ralph's out here. I don't, I don't think you have a Ralph's there, but it's like shaved beef, really finely shaved beef like they use for um, Philly cheesesteaks. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. And then like just go to town. In fact, I did it with with all my cooking show, but it was with, with, we found out that he didn't eat meat. That was classic. I had a guest on, then he found <laughs> right. out he didn't eat meat. So we had to, he told me he would do it. But anyway, you know, just making Philly cheesesteaks with peppers and onions and, and garlic and yeah. Um, but I, I do believe in recipes. I, I, I do believe in that. And once you learn to follow recipes, then you can follow your own, own instincts. See, I, yeah, and I've written down, so I've written down salt, citrus, and herbs. I'm actually, I'm going to try, you know? I think I'm going to yeah. give this a try. Yeah. Because, you know, like, I've been looking for the show that's called the America's Worst Cook, because I'm definitely yeah. going to apply if that happens. <laughs> but I, I'm going to give it a try. Now, what was, came to mind while you were talking, have any of your guests, you said you had one guest that didn't eat meat, have any of them been like, I, I'm as bad a cook as... Monica Samuels from the Mom's Club. I mean, can they all cook? Are they, are, are they just there for the singing or the, per, the experience? Or like, what's your, f what guest has been the most proficient in the kitchen that you've enjoyed? Oh. And who has been like, just a fun guest that I've, we've had that may, may have just been. Learning. Well, the, uh, David Archuleta from American Idol, he's a beautiful singer and just a beautiful person. And he has done like zero baking. And I thought I wanted to make something really sweet because he's so sweet. So I thought the chocolate cupcakes. Uh, and he learned a lot. You know, he learned how to mix dry and wet and combine together and how to pipe the frosting with the, with, you know, with the piping bag and how to garnish. And it, 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 he... It, it, it wasn't really the focus. Like it was more like come in the kitchen with me. And if you, there's David. Yeah. And, and if you do cook, then great. Like Lisa Loeb, she, she cooks. She in fact has like a little Instagram thing herself where she cooks for her family. So she was, was more versed in the kitchen. Um, but I mean, I think that was, uh, that's another reason why I wanted to do the show is also to inspire people. Like don't feel it's so intimidated. I mean, it is intimidating. All these chefs, they go to school there. They have these culinary, you know, skills that I feel like I'll never have unless I go to school. And I'd love to go to, to school one day. I would love to. But, um, you know, can you chop? There are certain knives that are better. Can you chop? Can you whatever? Yeah, you, you just learn this little by little. I mean, I've been cooking and baking for a long time. So I've made it a passion. I've made it a mission to become better at it. And the only way to become better at something is to fail and learn from your mistakes. Well, you've you've certainly inspired me, and I may make some brownies and send them to you to try. And if you take a bite and spit them out, then I will just take that as a compliment. Uh, Angela, welcome to the Moms Club. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and do you have a question for Carney? Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I am a mom of two boys, seven and 10, so things are always very exciting. Yes. I do wear several different hats of um, an assistant to a, a judge here in North Carolina, where I live, 
um, CrossFit athlete, breast cancer survivor, um, and just returned from um, a trip from Uganda where I feel like I reset my body in two weeks without having any processed foods. And if they had sugar, it was sugar cane, not refined sugar. So coming, it was interesting coming back to the United States and having even just a little bit of refined sugar, it sent my body. So I definitely understand your perspective with the sugar. I'm also gluten-free um, as well and cook with a lot of, um, I, I watch my macros. And for those that don't know, macros is pr- a protein priority. Um, so I use a lot of protein powder. My question is, sorry, just to give you a little context oh, on that. Thought you did. Huh? Um, I thought you did, yeah. Yeah. Um, my boys, I have two very different personalities in my boys. I have one boy who will try some vegetables. Um, we eat pretty healthy, but they still have a snack drawer. Um, you know, not a lot of um, chips in the house. But then I have one child who um, won't eat anything. And so it's not a, it's a personality thing for him, not necessarily how he's been raised because my other child will try everything. Any creative ideas besides, I mean, we've gone to the grocery store, let him pick out stuff. We've tried to get him to cook. And um, his famous line is, it's spicy. I mean, for everything, it's spicy. Um, But just to get him to try new things. I mean, we've had a three-day standoff before with this child. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, congratulations. Um, you're, you're pretty badass. I know that. Um, I, one, I have the same thing. I, Lucy just, and I hate like just talking about her, but it's like, I do have one child that just doesn't want to try things. It's really difficult. And as a mom, I find like I go into this, like, almost internal panic. Like they're not going to get into protein. They're not going to grow right. They're going to develop diseases. They're, they're on the, the trajectory is not good. The path is bad. And I, I find that when they get to a certain age, cause I think yours are still young, right? Young, yes. 15, right? So like, I try to say to them, look, when you eat certain foods, like they make you feel good. So like, this is going to help you feel good. You want to run and play and have your energy to play. Eat some of this and I pro- it's going to be better. You're going to have more energy to run. You can play more. I, I try to like, I, I would try to trick them like that. Um, also, you got to be creative. And I don't, I'm not great in this area. I just know that um, it, what, so the, the, the boy that doesn't want to eat a lot, what does he like? Well, he does very well with yogurt, cheese sticks. Um, but he will not eat meat. He will not eat vegetables, Okay, uh, which is, you know, two of the main things you're supposed to look at. What about pasta? Nope. No pasta. So, no mac and cheese, no pizza. No, um, we're down at peanut butter jellies. Okay. French fries. French, and, French fries. Yeah. He'll eat French fries and chicken nuggets. I mean, that's the normal kid. Thing. Oh, chicken nuggets. Okay, great. Well, good. At least you've got chicken nuggets. Um, so I would say, um, Wait, wait, I'm sorry to ask. What kind of chicken nuggets? Um, like the store kind. I have tried to make a gluten free. Right, tried right. To grill them. Um, so like I mean, the di- the dinos or whatever. Right from Tyson. <laughs> but, oh, Tyson ones. Uh, yeah, I know them. That's interesting because I thought the Tyson ones have like a lot of pepper. Um, the ones that I tried, they're a little peppery. Um, it's, it's interesting. So he likes dairy. He likes yep. cheese but he doesn't like bread or pizza or like carby pasta stuff. No. Okay. Um, you know, wow, that's tough. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever heard about a child not liking pasta. That might be the first. I would say if he is willing to eat the chicken nuggets, I would say start experimenting. In, in your kitchen, um, but he is eating those. I would go for the healthiest one, um, go to a Whole Foods, try to find the healthiest ones. Um, and let me think for a minute. Oh gosh, that's, I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> I, you know what, Angela, I, I'm going to give you my information after this because I really, I really would love to like, like th- let this like marinate a little bit, no pun intended. And I, I want to find something that I think would be great. This sounds like um, a, the start of another show where you kind of, can, if you can figure out what this child will eat, then you win the prize. That may be a good show. I could, 
Carolyn, welcome to the Moms Club. Tell us a little bit about yourself and can you ask a quick question of Carney? Sure. Um, well, I love all these comments. I think it's so interesting. And thank you, Carney, for just enlightening us on everything. I think your life has been so fascinating and you've had these amazing experiences. So I'm just thinking of all the challenges and things you've faced in your life. What makes you most proud as a mom to pass on to your girls? Like the things that you've learned and what you've you've kind of that wisdom you've gained through the years. I'm just curious about that. Oh, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, I think... I mean, it, it jumped out at me right away when you asked, and that is that we all make mistakes. And I think, and, and they can be just little mistakes or big mistakes. And um, for instance, you know, I, when I get frazzled or stressed, I tend to like snap and like raise my voice. And, and because it's like the dogs are always going crazy and barking and it's piercing bark and I'm, and I'm like, stop it. You know, I, I, I yell at the dog, stop it, you know. And and then it will translate, you know, like if they'll ask me, I'll go, what? And it's it's the tone of voice that's, it's not kind. And so I, I will say to them, I'm sorry I raised my voice. I'm sorry I did that. I shouldn't have done that. You know how much I love you, you know. And I feel like because I'm able to like admit that I do something wrong or out of line, it gives them the permission if they screw up with something, they make a mistake. They don't, they didn't, they knew they didn't study hard enough and they did not get a good grade or they failed or whatever. They learned that it, there's a consequence to the action and it's up to them to, to find their own, the, the power inside themselves to make the decisions to be better. And I, I, I love giving my kids the power their own power to make decisions rather than me being like, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to eat this, you have to eat that. I think it makes them feel like they're not good. They're not good enough. They're, there's something wrong with them because maybe they don't want to. But it's like, it's like I said, well, if you do, if you do make better choices, because it's all choices, if you make the better choice, you have the power to make that choice. You, and then they see it when they do it. They see what happens when they do do it. You know, you're not sleeping, Lucy. You want to stay up on your phone? Oh, fine. Let's see how you feel at school the next day. She feels like crap. Then she has a better sleep and she feels better. Look at what happened. You chose that, to do that. And now you feel better. That is great, great advice. And Carney, you are such an inspiration. We are so thrilled. This time has just flown by. It has been Aww. amazing talking to you. Where can our our moms out there find you on social media well uh you know i'm not great with facebook i still haven't figured out how to use it and do it which is really lame i know but i'm an instagram girl uh and usually the postings that i do with instagram because now i have somebody writing my facebook i've never had anybody do that for me so i finally went oh, i gotta do it so everything that i do on instagram goes to facebook now but um, yeah, Instagram, and um, I'm really I, I'm really slow to, to answering my my direct messages and stuff. But give it a shot. And There's a lot of people. So is it is it at Carney sixty eight? Is that where they can find you on Instagram? Okay, yes. well, great. Yes. Well, moms, check out Carney on Instagram. Check her out also. I know that Wilson Phillips has been performing here and there. They were at the California State Fair, so you can find them there. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, at Inside the Moms Club, and on our website, InsideTheMomsClub.com. Moms out there, I can't believe that the time has passed, but it has been amazing, as we say here on the Moms Club. But we will see you next time for celebrities and extraordinary moms just like you. We know all your me time is precious, valuable. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. And remember our Moms Club motto, if you don't laugh sometimes, you're going to cry. So let's laugh out there, ladies. Let's stay positive, and we'll see you next time inside the Moms Club. Yay, moms.